Just listen to the video. Good morning. I'm Stacy Thomas. I'm here with Mr. Hoyt Davis, who served in World War II in the Air Force. And we're here to celebrate men like him all over our world that have served in the armed forces to protect freedom. And we know that freedom is not free. It costs great sacrifice. And where is the church today in relation to that freedom? And what do we do? And how do we respond to it? That's the question we're going to answer this morning. I hope you stay tuned. God bless you. Amen. It's good for you to sing along with me this morning. As we thank God for the USA. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life, and I'd have to start again and begin a brand new life. I thank the Lord above that I'm living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom and you can't take that away Come on And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me and I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt of this land. God bless the USA. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee. Across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston, to New York to LA. Well, there's pride in every American heart, and it's time to stand and say that I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free, and I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me and i gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today cause there ain't no doubt i love this land god bless the usa and i'm proud to be an american where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land No doubt I love this land God bless the Amen. Thank you, Joe and Kim. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12. Where are we today in the midst of all of that? You know, I just think, uh, listening to them sing about, I don't have the percentages in front of me, but uh, it's about uh, five percentage of the population of the world being the United States and delivering over probably... Um, 
80, 90 percent of the gross national product of the entire world and uh, the higher percentage than that for the technology that's brought freedom to the world, convenience to the world, and uh, our forces who seek to uh, expand democracy and to seek to abate, to push back tyranny throughout the world. And see the greatness and uh, Alexander Tocqueville who came from France. Uh, when we were, I think it was the um, uh, 1830, somewhere around there, and that he came over here and he did a study from one part of this nation to the other to determine uh, the greatness of America and how we could grow so quickly in our technology, grow so quickly in our um, power and might and all those things. And he said, it's not in our industry. He said, it's not in their grand and glorious fields of harvest. He said, it's actually in those steeples that dot the entire nation. There is where you find the secret and strength of America. Now, here's an impartial, uh, probably an atheist uh, coming from France, to do a diagnostic, diagnostic test on America to determine why is she above the rest of the world when it comes to her, her greatness when you consider freedom and you consider her power to influence the world for good. Well, we obviously know it was in those church steeples, and at that time it was primarily a Protestant gospel that was preached throughout those, uh, starting with a Puritan basis and our forefathers and extending that ethic all the way across our nation. But uh, if I give you the, I'm not going to go through all of those, but the statistics today are close to 30% of Americans feel no necessary affiliation with any church today and, and no need to be a part of that. And about 50% of those that are 30 or under uh, will be in church today because they feel absolutely no uh, need or affiliation uh, with any church, nor do they see it having any bearing on their life. And so every year we basically lose people uh, out of the church in America. And so I know that uh, it looks like there's little pockets of revival here and there, and it would appear from Hillsong, Elevation Church, and those other uh, youth uh, thriving churches that um, it's not the case, but it is the case according to our polling uh, that uh, for the most part and we're down to about uh, less than 40% of Americans even profess to be Protestant at all. Uh, around 70% of the United States believe that religion is losing its influence on the American life. Uh, about 55% uh, believe that the churches and other religious organizations are only concerned with money and power. About 35% believe or hardly um, feel the need of any uh, affiliation whatsoever, and again, I'm repeating myself, but those that believe in no religion at all has doubled uh, since 2010, and so that's a fast-moving number away from God and showing uh, that m morality and church attendance and the things that we were raised on are in decline. I remember in 1978, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was asked uh, one year before I was married, and I would have been about uh, 22 years old, was asked to speak at Harvard. Well, that, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a man that spent years in prison in the gulag of Russia. He served under Stalin on the front lines, and he was decorated three times. He was a lieutenant with honors. And he disagreed with Stalin about the morality of an order, I think it was, to shoot prisoners. And I'd have to confirm that, but I believe that was right. I've read that long ago, but he, he wouldn't do it. And he said it's just immoral. And so he was uh, sentenced by Stalin himself to the gulag to serve time there. And he served many, many years in that prison. Well, they let him out finally, and he went back to teaching 
uh, mathematics, astronomy, and physics in Russia. And after that time, he wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago. And it was basically a recounting of the way that Russia operated during those years. And it was about the ugly face of socialism and communism. And because of it, he was deported. He was stripped of his Roman um, or his Russian citizenship and deported uh, to a eastern country. And finally, he came to Vermont, where he lived until he died. And he was asked to speak at Harvard for their commencement in 1978. Well, they thought they were going to get this beautiful speech about the dangers of socialism and the and an accounting, a recounting of what he'd experienced in his life in a Russian prison and those things. But it was not. He said, you folks think, and I'm just going to recount this after reading that uh, many times, but years ago. He said, you folks think that, you're in, that we are the ones to be pitied. He said, not so. He said, there was more of a clarity in Russia, basically, when communism took over, uh, in the early part of the 19th century, or the 20th century, than you guys even have a clue about now. You don't even see your road towards that. He said, your power of the social media, your power of the entertainment industry, your power of that that you've given to political correctness and all these other things, and that you've... He said, I am appalled that America has lost its moral courage. Now, this is in 1978. Trust me, it was not what Harvard, Harvard had expected to hear at that time, not by any means. And it's still considered one of the most famous speeches of recent times and a clarion call for us to wake up to what is coming. But as I... Look at this. I have to look at this from a Christian perspective, and I have to say, okay, God, what does the church really do in a world where these foundations and our Christian moorings uh, that gave us the freedom, it's only because we're a Christian nation that we have these freedoms. It's only because we've been a Christian nation. I mean, communism doesn't support uh, freedom of religion. Uh, if you go to uh, most of India or you go to Pakistan or certainly Iran or Iraq and those countries, you would not be able to have the kind of freedom that we have today. And so we do support freedom of religion. It's one of our Bill of Rights. And so we've experienced a freedom that other people don't, and we take it for granted. And so consequently, we're on the danger of losing that. But what is the church's response to that? And I want to go to Romans chapter 12 and 13 that we might look at that because as I think about this and I think about, um, I want to read you a portion of a man that I have incredible, incredible respect for, and that's John MacArthur. Uh, he's got one of the largest churches out in California and probably one of the largest is the, lar the largest uh, platforms of speaking of conservative Christianity today. And um, I just want to read what he says. It's not exactly what you think when I go to the conclusion. So I this, is, this, was a, this is a think piece today and a wake-up piece as well. So I just want you to indulge me for just a moment. What is a true perspective uh, for today's... Um, situation that we're in. It's, it's tempting to get caught up in political fervor, tempting to think that legislation is the key to solving the moral problems that plague American society. But is that a right perspective? Um, there was a time in the days of our Puritan forefathers when almost every soul in America acknowledged the Ten Commandments as the cornerstone of ethics and morality. Today, most Americans can't even name three of the ten. There was a time not so long ago when Americans universally disapproved of homosexuality, adultery, divorce. They believed that sexual promiscuity is absolutely wrong. They regarded obscene language as inappropriate. They saw abortion as unthinkable. They held public officials to high moral and ethical standards. 
Nowadays, most of the behavior of society once deemed immoral is defended as an inalienable civil right by our government. How times and the cultures have changed. The strong Christian influence and scriptural standards that shaped Western culture and American society through the end of the 19th century have given way to practical atheism and moral relativism. Moral relativism, you know, is basically, it could be true for you, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's true for me. Truth is subjective. It's because of your rearing. It's because of who you are. Had you been born in an Islamic country, you'd be Islamic. And since you're born in a Western country, you're obviously Christian. It's that kind of perspective, not based on any kind of objective standard or truth. The few vestiges of Christianity in our culture are, culture are at best weak and compromising to an increasing pagan society. They are cultic and bizarre. In less than 50 years' time, our nation's political leaders, legislative bodies, and courts have adopted a distinctly anti-Christian attitude and agenda. The country has swept away the Christian worldview and its principles in the name of equal rights, political correctness, tolerance, and strict separation of church and state. Gross immorality, including homosexuality, abortion, pornography, and other evils, have been sanctioned not only by society in general, but in effect by the government as well. A portion of our tax dollars are now used to fund programs and government agencies that actively engage in blatant advocacy of various immoral practices. But I want you to know that John MacArthur thinks that the, or he'll, it's in his sermon, one of his sermons that I read yesterday, that he thinks the American Revolution was wrong, uh, that we had no right to rebel against England, and that there's a different view of a Christian's relationship to government. And so with a man that I respect so much, I want to really consider today what is the appropriate response to what's happening legislatively, what's happening culturally uh, in our world in which we see a moral decline that seems to be just snowballing out of control. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. And then he talks about the gifts for just a moment. And then he goes to verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil, having regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I want you to think about that for just a minute for government. Now, where did government come from? God instituted government back in the Old Testament. He gave us government to put some kind of governor on evil. And so we have a government. It governs chaos. 
It governs free will run amok, where every man seeks its own way regardless of law and order. And so we have government. But before that, we started with what? We started with marriage. We were given family. We were given church. We were given government. Those are the four restraining forces in the world today. And God help us when they are pulled away. Because they will be to a large degree in the tribulation. So, chapter 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. But that's, that's pretty straightforward. Be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So what does that tell us right off the get-go? Government comes from God. And we are to respect the government. We are to obey the government. And this government is God-appointed. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So then the second statement is that if we resist this authority, we are subject to the judgment of God himself. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. There's another argument for capital punishment. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore... To all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, with all that being said, how do we relate to that as a Christian when we see good and evil redefined? When we see good and evil redefined contrary to the Bible, how do we respond? Well, let me take you back to the first century. Because in the first century, (laughs) Rome was not Christian friendly by any means. Jesus came into the world of an Augustus Tiberius who was considered Lord and God. He was the autocrat. He was the last word. He had the power of life and death over any individual that lived. And you remember when Herod tried to kill, or did try to kill Jesus and kill all the babies, nobody stopped him. He had had the power to do what he wanted to do. So Jesus came into the world of a very, very strong anti-God dictatorship. And When I look at what Jesus said and where Jesus was with that, what did he say basically? He didn't say a whole lot about government. But he never started a coup. He never said we need to enact social change. I mean, slavery was rampant in that day. He never said a word about slavery. What did he do? He said, render to Caesar those things that are Caesar. Render to God those things that are God's. He said, love all men. Go the second mile and demonstrate your Christianity. Did he force religion on other people? Not at all. If they accepted the kingdom of God, then they were part of it. If they did not, the disciples were told to shake the dust off their feet. Now, how did Christianity conquer Rome? And I want to put this in perspective as best I can. I'm going to give you some historical evidence here from Eusebius. He was bishop in a city in the Roman Empire, Caesarea, that had just gone through a famine and just gone through a devastating uh, series of blows that had hit them and weakened them to the point to where it was incredible. And everybody was leaving the city. 
but the Christians didn't leave. And Eusebius recorded during this plague that was taking lives by the score. He said, all day long, some of them, meaning the Christians, they tend to the dying and to their burying. Countless numbers with no one to care for them themselves. Others gathered together from all parts of the city. A multitude of those withered from famine and di distributed bread to them all. Cities in the ancient world were, and this is not a quote, were uh, overcrowded. They didn't have any sewer systems. They had all kinds of disease, all kinds of plagues. And they were continually harassed by different movements. But the, here's what he said. He said, Christians are continuing to grow in an incredible growth. He said, indeed, Christianity is dominating the empire in our major cities of the Mediterranean world. And they're doing it not by the conquest of the Roman Empire, not by the sword, but by preaching the gospel and with acts of compassion. He goes on to state that in the midst of this plague, Christians' deeds are on everyone's lips, quote unquote. They glorify the God of the Christians and these actions are convincing that they alone are very pious and truly reverent to their God. A few decades after Eusebius, the last pagan emperor, Julian the Apostate, was trying to get everybody away from Christianity and over to pagan religions of Rome. And he says that these Christian practices of compassion are causing this incredible transformation in culture. And when he was writing to a priest, he said, he said, when it comes to the poor that are neglected and overlooked by our pagan priests, these impious, as he termed them, actually would be pious, but impious Galileans, these Christians, they devote themselves to philanthropy. He said they support not only they, their poor, but they go to our poor as well. And when our people lack aid, even from us, they give it to them. He, he set about a campaign of copying Christians, and he taught these pagan Roman priests to do exactly what the Christians did. It didn't work. Because they didn't have this self sacrificial love and compassion that the Christians had and demonstrated to that world. And this is what he gleaned from it. I want you to listen to this. The God of Jesus Christ, for them, is a God worth dying for. Since he demonstrated his love, according to their writing, by dying for them. Secondly, they have given a new conception of what humanity is, that all human beings have special dignity and therefore should be shown compassion. Wow. I want you to really let that sink in. Here's a Roman emperor that is taking note of this sect called Christianity that has been outlawed for almost 300 years, that has been persecuted, and everything that could possibly be done to it to stomp it out, and it's thriving to the point to where he acknowledges how they do it. They have a reason to live. They have a power to die. They have hope in this world and eternal hope in the world to come. Now, so, I want to say a few things, and then I want to come back to something. So you're saying we shouldn't be involved in government? No, not at all. Are you saying we should just love our neighbor and we should just go about as Christians as I'm certainly saying that. But I'm also saying that that's the most powerful force that you have. 
to demonstrate your Christianity on a level in the midst of a pagan environment who can't understand it, who doesn't understand where you're going with it and what purpose that you're gaining from it other than obedience to God. So, I want to note a couple of things. When, when revival does take place, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put this in context, but I want you to bear me out. It will not be related to the fact that we change Washington. Because what's going on in the world right now in America is not a Washington problem. It's not a political problem. It's a sin problem. It's a sin problem. America was founded even by non-biblical writers such as Paul Johnson. And he says it. We could never have had the Constitution we've had, never had the Bill of Rights, had it not been for that first great awakening. George Whitfield, John Wesley, all of those guys that preached that you have dignity, you have a destiny, you have something within you. And these men, they gleaned from that that there was a purpose in them. And they didn't have to be treated as slaves. And the American Revolution was born because they felt like they could promote biblical principles without being tethered by England in a way that they could not do unless they severed that rope. Now, secondly, I want to state this to you. The state is temporal. Much of, I, I bleed red, red, white, and blue. But I have to acknowledge the fact that the state is temporal. It is changing. It is changing quickly. I was born in 55. I, I can remember when they used to have, uh, when, uh, 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 what's his name? I can, Bertrand Russell, the uh, atheist. He wanted to come to um, New York to teach. And the mayor of New York would not allow him because he said anybody... Can, that he can't come to New York University and teach any class if he doesn't believe in God. The mayor said that and prohibited him from coming. Can you imagine that today? It'd be the reverse. And so I have to see this changing of the tide. I'm going to address it. But the state is temporal. Souls are eternal. What is our main emphasis? In the midst, if we lose America, God forbid, we lose it to this cultural atheism and moral relativism, and uh, we just decline all the way down to the pits to where a totalitarian government has to take over because of the chaos. God forbid. But if we lose it, what is our anchor? Our anchor is still Jesus Christ. Our anchor is still the fact that we've got a job and it's to win as many souls to God and to Jesus Christ as we possibly can while we're alive because those souls last forever and any kind of, look at the Egyptian civilization, the Roman civilization, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, all of those are gone. America will one day be gone. Doesn't talk about it. In uh, Revelation. And so all I'm saying is what will last forever? Where is our emphasis? First of all, we preach the gospel. We never compromise the gospel. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. The only name given unto heaven whereby men must be saved. I'm sorry to say it as much as I respect them. And I love the people that are part of them. But every other religion is false. Only the religions that say Jesus Christ is the way to God are the true religions. The rest will lead to an eternity separated from God. Now that's a hard message, but that's the gospel message. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's not what I said. That's what he said. So we don't get to compromise on that. And that may cost you your life in days to come. Secondly, no matter what happens to us, we do deeds of compassion. 
We demonstrate who we are because we love our brothers just like we love ourselves, as much as we love ourselves, and we give to them because Jesus Christ gave to us, and agape love is flowing through us. What is agape love? It's unconditional. You don't have to love me back for me to love you. I've told you this story, true story. The guy that was in the army, sentenced wrongly, served all those years. I think it was 20, 30 years in prison. Finally, they found out he didn't do it. They let him out. They were interviewing him in the microphone. Don't you hate the army? He said, no, I don't hate it. I love it. He said, man, I love everything the army stands for. I love the country it defends. I'll never change. They made a mistake. I thought, that's about as close to a agape love as you can get. Deeds of compassion. Number three, godly living. You live as if Jesus Christ is standing beside you because he's closer than that. He's in you. Every day of your life. That's what you do. You know, uh, the Jews had no vote in human government. None at all. And Jesus said never rally to get the vote. They never said anything about overthrowing Roman tyranny or a new government. What did he preach about? The kingdom of God. It's eternal. It's coming. It'll be the greatest government the world's ever known. And all of these others are just necessary parts of the sovereignty of God. Jesus appealed to the hearts of men. You remember the rich young ruler? He gave him an opportunity for the gospel. But when he left, what did Jesus do? He said, behold how he loved him. But he didn't force him to take it. Christianity is, is not, okay, let me just say this. The Old Testament was a theocracy. What's that? That's ruled by God directly. In the Old Testament, they had to obey the law, or they were put outside the camp, or they were killed, or whatever. And that was a, a strict theocracy. Khomeini tried to instill a theocracy where if you're not Islamic, you're killed. That was never to be exported to the world. We, uh, Israel is to be an example to the world. Everywhere they've tried in theocracy, it's never worked. Jesus didn't impose that upon anybody. He said to the rich young ruler, you want to come? Come. You don't? He let him go, but he loved him. He didn't force him to come. Paul didn't force those people to come. Jesus said to his disciples, if they won't come, shake the dust off your feet. Move on to the next people. He appealed to their hearts, not to their rights. You have a right as a Jewish citizen uh, for freedom and all of this? He didn't appeal to that. He said, man, the kingdom of God is coming. You take your, you take your opportunity right now. He led no crusade to abolish injustice of any kind. Am I just hold? I'm not saying we don't do that. He said you return good for evil, and that's how he lived. Now, I want to say this to you. Is freedom of religion a biblical concept? Is it truly biblical? The short answer is yes, it is. Jesus gave us freedom of religion. He gave it to us. It is an inalienable right. He gave it to us. Free choice in the First Amendment. That's straight out of the heart of God. Free will. What does that do? It respects the image of God in man. That you have the power. To choose. God gave us that. But never forget. The Holy Spirit. Is the only one. Who can bring somebody. To God. He's the one that brought you. And you were no choir boy. Don't ever forget. The Bible says judge not lest ye be judged. We don't judge people. We come to them. We don't care who they are, homosexual, whatever they are. We don't judge them for that. 
We say, man, I was a sinner in a different way, just as bad. And I'm telling you that Jesus is the answer to your search. He is the answer. Bar none. All right. Let's go to our country real quick. The Declaration of Independence. Let's talk about it for just a minute. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to abolish and alter and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such forms as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object invents a design to reduce them, reduce them to utter despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new, to provide new guards for their future security. Okay. What are the premises to be gleaned from that? First of all, let's look at him. He said the laws of nature and nature's God. So he's saying there is a moral law that originated in and from God. The laws of nature and nature's God. Secondly, he says that Nature's God, obviously there is a God, number two. And then he said, we hold these truths. There is knowable truth. Truth, what is truth? Truth is something that cannot be defied. It is something that corresponds to the way things really are. It is something that corresponds to reality. That's truth. Whether it be scientific truth, whether it be philosophical truth, religious truth, it doesn't matter. He says... There is truth. And he says, we, we are endowed by our creator. So there is a creator. They acknowledge there's a creator God. And he said, among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness given to us, endowed by the creator. So our creator gave us our inalienable rights for these particular things. Now, and he says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So governments are given to protect these rights. Now, number seven, according to this piece of paper, our government, we have a right to oppose such government that does not protect those rights. Now, what are those rights? Freedom of speech and religion, freedom of right to keep and bear arms, the conditions of quartering soldiers, we don't have to do that, right of search and seizure, right of due process of law, freedom of, from self-incrimination, double jeopardy, rights of accused persons, the right to a speedy and public trial, the right of trial by jury, freedom from excessive bail, cruel and unusual punishments, other rights of the people, powers reserved to the states. Now, with that being said, I have to ask a question to me, and I have to really go around in my mind. If we never get involved in protecting these rights, then what in the world are we celebrating on the 4th of July? Because we are here as a nation because of that revolution. We are here because... We protected that freedom in World War I and in World War II because we did not want a country run by the Third Reich and Nazism, fascism, 
We didn't want the country that, and we didn't want them to get that power. And what they were doing, we thought, was unconscionable. The killing of six million Jews, that there is a time to stand up and say, we will not allow this. This is not freedom, and we have inalienable rights, and we want to protect their rights. There is a time to do that. I believe as Christians. Edmund Burke wrote, all that's necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Now, God has called us, I believe, first and foremost, to do all that we can from a Christian basis. And I think that we do everything we do. We are here members, we're promoters of peace, not war. There are all kinds of ways to peaceably change government. You can run for office. You can be on the council. You can be a mayor. You can be a legislator. You can be a senator. You can run for president. There's ways to do that correctly. And when called upon, we stand up. But how is the main way we change this? If my people, which are called by name, my name, will humble themselves, repent of their ways, confess their sins, turn to me, I will have mercy on them and heal their land. So what does that mean? That means that it comes through prayer. Now, let me just ask you something. Here's what Alexander Solzhenitsyn said to us. He said, I'm appalled at you Christians, because he's a Christian. He said, I'm appalled at you guys, because you don't seem to be aware of the fact that freedom is not free. And you are moving so fast towards a socialistic government that you cannot even see it. He said, it's so incipient, it, it, it is so insidious and yet, you folks, as long as you can buy your next meal, and as long as you can go on your next vacation, and as long as you can buy your next car and drive with the windows down, you are oblivious to what is being stolen from you. And you must wake up. Do something. Pray with all of your power for God to show you what to do. But evil is not a static force. It never stops and stays on its own. It moves progressively forward. The church is the only restraining force against corruption. Ephesians teaches us that. Jesus taught that. He said, you're the salt and light of the world. If you don't be that, you're good for nothing to be thrown out and to be collected clay so that you can make good pavement. It's all you're good for if you don't fulfill your purpose for being born. Let me ask you something. Why were you born? Be happy. Have a great life. Have all your needs met. Money in the bank. Rock on your porch. I don't think so. You weren't born for that. You were born to bring glory and honor to Almighty God. And that is the greatest joy you'll ever experience. Moses only asked for one thing. Can I see your glory? Jesus prayed in John 17 that they, Father, that they may behold our glory. The glory that I had with you before I left. To come to them. Let them behold it with us. And where we are, let them be. You talk about a parade. <laughs> you talk about a celebration. When World War II was over, if you'd have been there in, in the streets of New York or Washington and you'd seen the ticker tape coming out of the windows and you'd have seen those soldiers parading through, you would have thought the parades never get better than this. But I want to tell you one there's coming one that's going to be so far above that, exceeding that, you have no idea. 
Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. When he comes to get us, and he takes us back. And we get to see that glory. But all of that will pale in insignificance, I'm afraid, to a moment if we don't hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We were born to a particular generation to affect that generation. And if we don't be salt and light here in our church, in our families, which is our first pew, which is our first audience and our first ability to make change and instill a barrier of salt and light for the world protection if we fail there God wants us to remember we have an agenda and if we lose everything we have in this country all the freedoms and paganism reigns it won't change our calling one iota because Jesus didn't change it from two words. He said, follow me. His road led him to the cross. I'm not guaranteed to get out of this world alive. And are we willing to love him as unto death? You show me a Christian that's willing to lose everything for God, I'll show you somebody that'll make a difference. That's the power that will change America back to God. Remembering that it's God's work, it's God's calling. It is loving our neighbor, not making them our enemy, but making them the mission field. They're the ones that need Christ or they're going straight to hell. It's our calling to share while we still can and give them hope. Hope. Let's pray. Father, we come before you thanking you, almighty God, that we have a calling. We have a calling. We have a calling to win souls to you. You tell us, make disciples of all men, teaching them whatsoever I have taught you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have an agenda, and it's an agenda of unconditional love, to love anybody, anywhere, at any time, and know that that is the person you've set in front of us for the moment, to bring to Jesus Christ. So they may find hope, peace, harmony in this life, no matter what happens to them. And Father, we'll thank you and we'll praise you. Oh God, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our laziness. Forgive us of the fact that we don't seem to care about those that have died on battlefields for the freedom that we have. Forgive us for the fact that we don't honor their sacrifice. Teach us that freedom is not free. Teach us, God, that the devil hates freedom. He loves bondage. Any type of. And let us be promoters of freedom throughout all the world. And let America return to what it used to be long, long time ago. A righteous might that said Jesus is the way. And we'll stand behind it with everything we have. We'll love you and we'll protect you even if you don't believe it. But that is who we are unmistakably and Father we ask you to give us grace and give us mercy for all this we pray in Jesus name and for his sake Amen 
Thank you so much for watching today's sermon. We hope you get blessed from that. If you want any more information about today's sermon or any past sermons, you can certainly contact us through our Facebook page. Just feel free to send us a message. Also, we always welcome you to like, comment, and share this sermon with others. You can give any gifts, tithes, or offerings to the church. You can find us on PayPal, which is books.ohbc at gmail.com or on Tithely at Orchard Hills Church. Once again, we appreciate you tuning in. God bless. We'll see you soon.